I'll never forget that moment. Like we've just the, she was it, there it's just like with Putu. It was just this Putu. Putu just couldn't believe it. Man, we was, were just You mean could Puta not believe is it. Puti? What is going on? <laughs> what? P- no. Putina. Yeah. Oh jeez, oh, all right. Me. We got a bodega? Anyway. We do. It's it's uh Let's- it's an interesting one this week. It's very, very Bodega. different to the other ones. But are you ready? Is it? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't I know quite so. how to pronounce this. It's it's Spanish okay. for twelve. So is it do, do, doce or doce? I can't remember anyway. Part twelve. Let's say it that way. Bodega, part doce. Zero one one zero zero one one zero one zero one. Droned Kratos Nebish, one of the most surveilled men in the galaxy. He was arguably the best and most prolific computer hacker in the galaxy, and for three years he'd been under house arrest in his apartment on Snide 4, and for that entire period, even in his sleep, he'd been emitting a string of binary digits. Investigator Patar knew this, because for those three years she'd been watching Nebish on a small monitor in a tiny, cramped, hateful surveillance truck jammed up against her large, sweaty, hateful tech assistants. Anything today? she asked, wheezing on a vape and sipping a scoffee. Nah, said the tech guy. Even in those three years, she hadn't spoken with the tech guys other than in a professional capacity. She just sat there fiddling with her phone, waiting for Nebish to do something, to give himself away somehow, to slip up. He hadn't. The binary was, presumably, Nebish's way of flaving with the feds. As soon as his trial at the Supreme Court of Snide had ended the way it had, in a legal deadlock, he was doomed. Any trial on Snide was essentially a life sentence, thanks to the insanity of their judiciary. 90% of the beings on Snide were lawyers, or worked for lawyers. The other 10% were cops or judges. Every other need and function was handled by robot. Everything was automated. Except, by law, the law. As a result, the planet's entire economy was structured around lawsuits. And naturally, Patar was being sued by both of her tech assistants, and she in turn was countersuing them. The cases would never see a courtroom, thanks to the decades-long backlog. However, since the economy of Patar depended on people's possible lawsuit settlements, this was fine. She could get a mortgage using her lawsuit as collateral. Her bank would naturally sue her in return, but this was all part of the arrangement. Zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero. For the first few weeks, the surveillance team had worked around the clock to figure out what the binary code meant. Sometimes it turned out to be a recipe for soup. Other times it was just a string of prime numbers. Once it was the transcript for the entire 12 season run of How I Sued Your Mother, a popular sitcom starring, of course, robots. After they realized he was messing with them, they stopped trying to work out what the code was and just recorded it. Years worth of ones and zeros and none of it meant a thing. Nebish knew that there were hundreds of people watching and listening to his every move. Not just the feds, but every law firm in town was also watching him. He had chosen to defend himself in court, and under Snydean law, this meant he was open to being sued by every law firm that he hadn't hired. Each was entitled to surveil him themselves, and each did. And since his apartment, by nature of his crimes, was a Faraday cage, it was impossible to listen in from a distance. No communication could be made into or out of Nebish's lair except by hardline. Hence why the outside of his apartment was a mass of cables and wires, each leading to a van parked in the melee of vehicles that encircled his dwelling. (laughs) His apartment itself was isolated, raised up on stilts so that it could be observed from every angle. The interior was a mass of tiny cameras and bugging devices. If Nebish moved, the cameras knew. When he was eating, watching TV, sleeping, taking a crap, it was all being recorded by hundreds of people. Worse still, Nebish was locked in and they were locked out. He'd placed an impenetrable Shrovian force field around the apartment to protect himself from assassins, and the code lock was on the outside, so he could never be coerced into opening it. He was unassailable (laughs) and uncorruptible. No legal compunction or physical threat could force him to open the force field because it was impossible for him to do so. Similarly, nobody could ever crack the code so it was impossible to break in. He couldn't signal outside anyway thanks to the Faraday cage. It was a remarkable stalemate. Nothing got in, nothing got out, except for the surveillance footage and the feds and the lawyers had control of that. As a result of this mess, the Nebish case was the number one employer on Snide 4. If the case ever ended, it would disrupt the economy so much that it would lead to a runaway recession. Investigator Fatah (laughs) shuddered. Her entire existence and the livelihoods of billions of people involved surveilling a man whose case was so important it couldn't be allowed to end. She picked up her phone and checked the news feed. Nothing of interest. Pork belly futures were up. There was a traffic jam between sectors 18 and 19, and there was going to be a brief scheduled power outage in their area in about 10 minutes' time. Nothing to worry about. The power outage was bang on schedule. Street lights blinked out one by one, then after about a minute, they blinked back on. One of them seemed to be taking its sweet time as she stared at it, hypnotized by its incessant blinking. Blink, 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 pause. Blink, 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 blink. Patar yawned. What a life. She checked the monitors. 
There was Nebish droning on. Zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero. After a few minutes of listening to zeros and ones for the billionth time, she checked her phone. Another scheduled power outage? Jeez, what was going on at the power plant? She would sue, but it was all run by robots and they had no legal status. The lights again went out. Again, they flicked back on. Again, Patar yawned. Uh, holy flav, said one of the tech guys. Patar heard nothing. For the first time in three years, there were no zeros, no ones. Had Nebish died? Was it over? He's, he's gone, said the tech guy. Patar's blood ran cold. Impossible, impossible. She ran out of the van. In the street, a thousand other investigators and lawyers, all staring at the apartment. Then up at the sky, as a sleek black vessel soared into the upper atmosphere. She blinked a few times. Her brain and an idea were having a serious fight right now. The tape! Run back the tape! The last five minutes, she shouted, diving back into the van. They looked at the footage. Same old Nebish and his binary droning. What's he saying? Run it, she said. The tech guy punched in the numbers and the computer spat something out. Something meaningful this time. Not a recipe, not a sitcom, a 753 character code. It had to be the code to the force field. He was signaling someone, whispered Patar. He knew they were coming. One of the tech guys, starting to tremble, raised his hand. What, barked Patar. What would be the point of giving out the code? He couldn't have known there was anyone coming. Remember, the Faraday cage. No signal gets in or out, except, he paused. Except through us, said Patar. Run the outside footage back from the power cut. There it was, the blinking of that streetlight. She quickly encoded it to binary. One blink for zero, two for one. Run it, she screamed. The code said, Howdy, pard. Here to bust you out. <laughs> Breath and shuttle cloaked <laughs> over your ranch. Need the code, pard. She began tearing the van apart, ripping up the seats, the monitors, the fabric of the roof. That's where she found a tiny bugging device and a tiny cable that led out into the street. She followed it, pulling it up as she went. It had been glued down to the pavement, tucked into the cracks. It wended its way across the busy road to a shop, a small market. There was a neon sign over the door. It said simply, Bodega. Patar, <laughs> Patar dropped the cable and fell to her knees. Snipe 4 was ruined, and the worst and therefore best hacker in the galaxy had just teamed up with one of the most wanted men alive. The end. Oh, oh man. That, that was, was really a good, good one. That, that was, was really, really good, fucking Perry. good. Thank Holy that's really, shit. That's some great fucking work setting, <laughs> setting that up. That yeah, was glorious. That, that was really good. Holy fuck. Hats off. Thank you. It was a magnificent a hat, but... little short. I liked it a lot. Yeah, oh. me too. Man, that I was, was so deeply That was engrossed. one of the best you've done, I think. Really? I didn't think you yeah. guys would like it. I thought it was going to be a bit no, too... I thought that was fucking Weird. perfect. It was so good. Oh, that was I especially like the bodega thing at the end. <laughs> the, yeah, the side I love that. Above the market. Yeah. <laughs> that was a nice touch. Thank you.